Hi, folks. I'm Jack Kennedy. You're very welcome to this evening's special webinar uh, tonight. The focus is calf rearing. Uh, this is the fourth in a series of six webinars taking place this spring on FarmersJournal.ie. Shout out to our sponsors, first of all, AXA Insurance and Chanel. Um, remember, folks, we want your questions. Uh, I have a panel of specialists here with me, Adam Woods, Declan Marn, and Aidan Brennan. Uh, email your questions to webinar at farmersjournal.ie or WhatsApp 086 Um The format is the same, folks. You're well used to it at this stage. We're going to show, I suppose, a couple of short videos and then we come back to the studio and have a chat with the specialists on what we have just seen or the questions and answers that you submit um, as we're watching the videos. Uh, all the videos have been shot in the last 10 days. Um, and then we come back to the studio, as I said, and have the, the live questions and answers with our team. So first up, Adam and Declan were down on the Thrive demonstration farm. That's our dairy beef demonstration program. They were down on the Thrive uh, farm in Cashelin County, Tipperary, 10, 10 days ago, as the first calves for 2022 were arriving. In this video, uh, the lads discuss a bit about the background to the Thrive program and how calves are sourced from the farms involved. Let's have a watch. Okay, Declan, we're here on the Thrive demonstration farm in Cashel in County Tipperary. It's the end of February. The first of the 2022 calves have just arrived. Before we get into the technical aspects of the programme, tell us a little bit about what Thrive is all about. Yeah, so Thrive, Adam, I suppose the major difference between this programme and you know, any other dairy calf to beef system happening out there is that we 100% know the genetics we're working with. We're using all AI sired calves. We know, we know the herds are coming off, so we know the dam details there. We know the health protocols on those farms. So we know, you know the colostrum management is right on those farms. So from day one, we're starting off you know, with everything in our favor. Um, and as we'll discuss later on, the economics are still difficult, but you know, starting, we're not going into a mart and buying in the dark. You know, I know there's more information on boards now, but still in terms of knowing the genetics behind that animal, you know, this program has a great benefit from that point of view. It's a flagship programme for the Irish Farmers Journal and there are a number of key industry stakeholders involved in the programme. Yep, so we have Kerry and Arevo in terms of our, our co-ops, then we have Progressive Genetics, uh, Munster AI, Dovea Genetics and then we have ICBF and Board BS. So, you know, all industry stakeholders are trying to improve the whole thing. As we know, there's more and more beef coming from the dairy herd, 60% of the beef coming uh, the national kale now comes from the dairy herd each year. Um, and dairy beef has a lot of challenges to overcome in the next few years. So this program has been designed to you know, show best practice, but also to highlight indus industry issues and, and try and overcome those challenges in the future. I suppose to go through some of the objectives of the Thrive program, is it, I guess, for dairy farmers or is it for beef farmers or is it for both? It's equally. I see it as, as important for dairy farmers as it is for beef farmers. Look, dairy farmers need to have a customer for their calves every spring. Um, all we see is, is a bad week's weather and what effect that can have. Um, who knows what's going to happen with live exports coming down the road. Definitely the quality of that beef calf coming off the dairy herd needs to improve. Um, and, you know, huge challenges towards that in the future. As good as we are with the beef sires that we use, and the genetics companies have done a lot of work in the last few years improving the, the quality of that bull that's going on out to the dairy farms, we still need to talk about and address the major issue, which is the beef ca characteristics of, of the dairy cow. Some of the main challenges that you've found so far, I guess, we've been working on this farm now for a number of years. You have a number of satellite farms around the country. What, what's the main, I suppose, challenge you see within those dairy calf to be systems? It's multiple. It, number one is calf quality. If you don't have that right day one, you're in serious trouble. Um, after that, unfortunately, it is calf price is probably the next thing there that for the genetics that we're, we're purchasing, we're probably overpaying on day one. Again, if you do that, no matter how good your technical uh, ability is on farm, you're still not going to make up for that initial uh, outlay uh, on, uh, for in calf purchase price. Then there's a huge amount on the technical side of things from right from rearing through to grassland management. You know, a lot of suckler farmers have gone into dairy calf to beef in the last couple of years where your grassland management mightn't be fully up to scratch on a suckler system. That cow will kind of cover you on that side of things, they will alleviate the pressure. In a dairy calf to beef system, there's no room for that. You have to be on your game every single day you're out at grass. These need to be going into the right covers, coming out of the right covers, moving two or three times a week, 
Um, so it's, it's not a simple system, it's a specialised system and uh, you know, technical efficiency needs to be really good. Finally, the number of breeds that we're working with here on, on John Hattie's farm and within, within the whole programme, just give me a little idea of what you're working with there. Yeah, so here on Hallie's we buy in 140 calves each year. They're a mixture, half and half heifers and bullocks. And then we are looking at probably 75, 80% of those are early mature in your Angus and your Hereford. And then we'll bring in a small proportion of Limousin and Belgian Blue as well. Last year we brought in some Simmental. Um, we'll bring in any calf that um, meets our criteria in terms of selection. So we need at least a positive carcass value of five euro from the sire and, and, a, and a beef value then on the dairy beef index of at least 50 euros. So once they meet those ca uh, criteria, we'll, we'll purchase in the calf if it makes financial sense to purchase in the calf. You know, last year we bought in very few um, late maturing animals just because we couldn't um, justify the cost of those calves on day one. So we had a lot more early maturing. This year, you know, with the first uh, nine calves in on the farm, again, you're probably going to look 80, 80, 85% of those calves being early maturing. Out on the satellite farms around the country, most of them are operating on that early maturing heifer. And the simple reason for that is it suits the system where they want to get them away before the second winter. So you're lowering your costs, not having to go back into a winter finishing system, finish them off grass. Okay, there's lighter animals, but you can carry more of them per acre and that way they're probably maximising their farm output that way. I know we've had some questions from farmers in the past in relation to pushing things on as regards finishing animals off grass for that, that first, let's say, second grazing season, um, and then there's going into the shed, but then there's going back out to grass. For farmers that, that may not be as good at grassland management or, or may have a lower stocking rate, do you think is, that, is, that, is there a role for that in terms of going back to grass for that third grazing season? There probably is, Adam. Like if you look at national average figures, and national average figures... What we're killing at 19, 20 months, at national average level, they're killing at 24 months at the same carcass weight. You know, and that means they're coming out of a shed after a lot of uh, concentrates going in there over an expensive winter. So definitely where, the, where your stocking rate isn't that high on farm, probably keeping them ticking over um, on a silage-based diet over winter, going back to grass for 90, 100 days, probably would make more sense. Also, from a system point of view, when we go out in spring, our biggest demand group are 360 kilos. You know, we don't have a huge demand for grass in spring, and often it can be very difficult to maintain quality um, in that early part of the season. So if you had you know, a batch of cattle going back to grass, that would be going to be 550 kilos or so. That would be a real help in, in maintaining grass quality early season. Good stuff. Uh, thanks, Declan. Nice little snapshot, I suppose, of what's happening or what was what was happening 10 days ago down on the tribe farm. You had some scotty little black calves landed, Declan, at that stage. Have you many more landed at this stage? Um, probably not as much, Jack, as we'd like. Um, we have 26 on farm as of today. Um, we were probably up at 45 or nearly 50 at this time last year. So just a little bit slower, but look, we're still early, not getting over panic just yet. Um, you see those kind of I suppose the beef semen maybe is just coming through now on, on a lot of dairy farms and those calves are starting to come available for sale. So I would I hope was, in the I next... Was, yeah. I was going to ask you like what your thoughts are on calf price, but I think we got it there in the video. You said that they, they were probably overpriced. I think you said you just kind of... But that's Adam, Adam Woods. Adam Woods is just he, just... he has that line. It just comes out of his head. Like no matter what price, calf price is, they're overpriced. Like, you know what I mean? We have to stand back from the ring and all that. Like, you know, I mean, where, where are you on price now? Like, you know what I mean? In terms of... What, what, what well, like, I mean, it, like, uh, is it fair to say, Declan, like beef price has changed, like, and, and has that meant a difference in terms of your calf purchase price? Yeah, beef price has changed, Jack, but so has input prices as well. Like, so you have to take it all into consideration. Um, there definitely okay. seems to be, you know, maybe the calf market going maybe in two directions. You see that Frisian bull calf, maybe that bit cheaper this spring, and look. There's probably a bit more value in that for each bull calf than these beef sired calves at current prices. I was talking to Adam about this the other day. You know, the, the beef sired calf is worth a Frisian bull calf price plus X, whatever that may be. But, um, you know, we should be basing our, our beef sired calf price off our Frisian bull calf. And that's not happened. There, there seems to be no correlation at all. Um, these beef sired calves, uh, I know again it's 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 early and, and there's low enough numbers yet, but there's a huge demand for them out there. Um, from yeah. from rearers, yeah, Aiden. Like I mean, Declan, Declan is right. Like it's 
it's relatively early days for coloured cows from dairy farms. And I'm just saying coloured now, that's, you know, I'm just using that. It's not, you know, so like it's, it's relatively early days for beef, beef bred animals of, of, in dairy herds. Yeah, sure. Traditionally, Jack, you do six weeks of, da- of dairy, dairy AI and then you let off the, the stock bull or, you know, it do, there's an increasing number, I suppose, of, of AI beef going in now as well. And that would mean then your beef calves come after St. Patrick's Day, typically. Uh, so we're still a little bit early yet, but um, there are more farmers, I suppose, using more beef. They're doing more selective breeding and there's more beef mm. going in earlier in the season as a result of that. But it's still small numbers. like yeah, Adam, I was having this row with you earlier, like in terms of you were saying it's, it's you know, the, the early calf and it's worth so much more, etc. And that kind of thing, you know, but the, the early beef calf, like, I mean, calves could still be born now here. The, here we are, the 9th of March. Um, you might get them in two or three weeks time and it still do your job in terms of getting out before that second winter. Is that fair to say, especially for those traditional breeds, I call them? Yeah, it's about, Jack, it depends where we're in the part of the country you're in. We're seeing in Cashel, we're, we're able to do that. We're seeing on other, some of the other satellite farms, we're not able to do that, I guess, where, where, where land type is maybe a little bit harder and where the, where the grazing season isn't as long and maybe where grassland management. Look, we're trying to do everything we can right on Cashel. Uh, John Halley is, is an excellent grassland manager. Uh, Declan is up and down from there. And we're getting... Uh, good performance there but I suppose as we move west onto the satellite farms harder and harder but yeah I think the average date of birth Declan can correct me here but it's around sort of that 9th 10th of March I think for the last couple of years on our dairy beef cows that are going into John Halley's and we're able to finish the large proportion of them off we'll say grass at the end of the second grazing season so yeah that's right but I'd say maybe as we move west maybe there's more value mm-hmm. in that earlier calf because we might we mightn't be as good maybe in terms of a longer grazing season uh, Declan, is that, that's the average. Is that the average? Is like, like last year, for example, or the year before, in terms of what you've slaughtered now? Are the, are the is that was that the average age? Give me roughly yeah, in terms of yeah, you're looking at the end of the first week of March is typically the, the average birth date there. Um, we get a good share of them in the last week of February, and then you know first two weeks of March, and the kind of it's usually the typical date. As Adam says, those guys up west probably would prefer that earlier calf, but it's probably the inverse to to the supply of them around them. You know those. Uh, say dairy farmers in the west maybe calving that a little bit later and again that we've seen them not coming through again until later on in, in the season so you have a double whammy there so there is definitely um you know issues around that later born calf where where it sits in and it, it there's no two ways about it it's going to have to go back out for a third grazing season if it's to make money okay um Declan I was watching I don't know what mark it was I could it could have been care mark last week and there was solid solid you know i'll say 50 kilo herefords coming in boys and girls making you know 200 250 like you're right and then there was there was 40 kilo frisians and they weren't making a, a fiver you know i mean you talk a bit about that difference between the the frisian calves at, at a fiver versus the her the, the herefords at 200 250 i mean it, you know it's fine but they're they're a different type of an animal like you know and you're you're going to have to tailor your finishing to that like is that fair to say like it is, yeah, and I suppose maybe that's why that early maturing type animal is so sought after because they're easier fleshed, they'll, they'll finish off grass probably that bit easier, um, whereas you know, with your Frisians maybe that bit harder and maybe take that bit more meat to get over the line, but there's definitely not 210 euro of a difference in, in the cost of getting them over the line either. Um, you know, okay, take out your bonus uh, that you'll get on your early maturings, but um, it's still, I'd struggle to see that much of a difference between the two of them. Even if we put 30 cent, uh, we'll say Declan, 30 cent of an Angus bonus, and we even say 30 cent on the grid of a minus because of the, the lower grading of the Frisian, that's, you know, 60 cent multiplied by you know, whatever, you know, 270 or 280 kilos carcass, you're, you're, what are you up at there, your 200 euros is or something like that in terms of, you know, a price differential. Uh, so, yeah, you're probably so, 160 euros. Yeah. Okay, so so where are you now in terms of price? Like, what is that, what is that Hereford Buller, uh, Buller Heifer worth? And, you know, now if and for, for you to do your sums on it and to leave a certain margin at the end, like have you a number kind of in, in terms of what, what the, the models are, are telling you now? Uh, we're trying to, well, obviously we're trying to get them as cheap as we can, as we always try and do. But look, we want a decent quality calf. So like you can go out and buy Angus calves tomorrow morning at 100 quid, but um, they're not going to be the ones that we're going to be wanting to have. So um you know, you have to be realistic on that side of things too. The ones that we bought so far, the Angus heifers coming in between 175 and 190. The Angus bulls are coming in around 205 to 220. Um, and they'd be two to three week old. If you look at the ICBF um, calf price data this week, you know, I'd say a three week old Angus is coming in there at 175. Um, 
for a heifer, two away for a bull, and our herd one nine three for a heifer and two three one for a bull. Okay. But what I'm hearing out, out on the ground is that you know those there's maybe uh, more calves trading farm to farm, and maybe you know the pick of the bunch has been taken on farm to farm trading, and then what maybe isn't being picked up by farmers there is going to the market currently, and you're maybe seeing a lower average price in the market than you might be getting than farmers are getting. I know they're getting um, directly off farm. Right. Director of farm to farm. Aiden, I, when I was watching the market, I was I, like, there was a lot of them. They, they were the lighter type Frisians. Now they were straight Frisians, like because you have you, you have your dam and you have the whole lot, like in terms of the information that's on screen. Um, but like they were young, you know, and they looked young, and like they weren't getting the, like they weren't getting a fiver or a ten or even some of them, you know, working for 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 straight young black and white calves. Like I mean, all they needed was two or three weeks of milk. Of course, there was a cost to that. Like I mean, but. You know, is it is it nearly is it nearly moving to that that they need to be at that kind of fifty kilo plus before they come into the mart? Well, it depends on who you're talking to, Jack. Like, I mean, so I'm listening to this now. What you're after saying there, and if I was a bee farmer wanted to make money, sure, wouldn't you buy those those calves at that age for that for fiber and keep them for that two or three weeks? And sure, you get eighty or ninety euros for maybe in, in two or three weeks time if you wanted to sell them again. Now, no, that's kind of dealing. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not suggesting that's what yeah. we do, but like that's a you know a, a rough example of of where does potentially to make money in this game. Uh, if you want to buy those cheaper calves, they grow into good frames, only that they're a little bit young. Now, yeah. on the dairy side, I suppose some farmers will just need to get rid of calves. They'll want to sell them uh, at that lighter age because they just maybe they haven't the shed space or they haven't the labour. Or, or, or what other reason they're afraid they're going to get locked up or some other issue is there um, and they want to offload them but like you, you're, you're right for them to make the money they, they probably need to hold on to them until they're the 50 kilo seems to be seems to be this arbitrary figure that 50, 50 kilo weight uh, and yeah. if they're 48 they're worth 5 or if they're 52 they're worth yeah. 100 like for me that yeah. doesn't make sense either um, but like if that's yeah. the way the market is going sure we need to play it like well, so, 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 some of that, some of that, some of that's coming from the exporters, Jack. In terms yeah. of you know, Bandon this week would say you're you're talking under forty eight kilos. They're not buying those calves for exported. It's the exporter is driving that um, as mm-hmm. regards that calf weight. And maybe yeah. there's a little bit of the online buyer maybe in it as well. Showing so in terms of a weight going up for a calf, it's it's a great advantage to a to maybe an online buyer there in terms of having an idea what sort of a calf is in front of you and the very late calves are being avoided. Yeah, oh, uh, I, think I, I think that weight one has had a huge effect in marks this year. I'd say it nearly has a bigger effect than have the dam breed up there. Um, you know, it's it's really been a game changer. I think it's just opened lads' eyes maybe to see you know the work out of a, a price per kilo they fairly figured out pretty quickly. Like. Okay, reminder, folks, email your questions to webinar at farmersjournal.ie or WhatsApp 086-836-6465 and we get to them in the next slot. I'm going to introduce our second video. I mean, bringing in 140 calves from multiple different locations needs to be carefully orchestrated. And in this next video, the lads discuss the health protocol on the demonstration farm. Let's have a look. Okay, Declan, we'll talk a little bit about, I suppose, health protocols as we go on to the farm here, a new calf protocol. I suppose that first three weeks is absolutely critical in terms of the performance of that calf for the rest of its life. If we start back, I suppose, in May 2021, when these calves here behind us were actually bred and, and actually inseminated into dairy, on dairy farms, the programme is a little bit unique in that you have control over what genetics is used on those dairy farms, but I guess there's nothing stopping a beef farmer going to a neighbouring dairy farmer and saying, look, if you use these bulls, I'll buy these calves off you. Definitely, like this is what we need to get to. This program, it needs to be able to be scaled up to a to a national level. Like so, how do we get there? You know, it is about linking up rearers with dairy farmers. More feedback on this bull worked well. This bull, I wouldn't be so gone on. Leave him out. Um, but it is if if you're already sourcing off one or two farms, you're already you know that, that should be happening because you have that relationship built up. So for both dairy farmer and beef farmer, it's about sitting down looking at the, the, the dairy beef index, you know, using that as a tool to select sires for the years going forward. Gestation length and um, calvinese are, are always going to be the be all and end all to the dairy farmer. But the great thing in, is within the DBI, there's, there's bulls that will deliver those plus uh, a, a decent carcass value and a, and a decent beef value. So it's about matching those up with different uh, times of your breeding period as well. So, you know, earlier on in the breeding period, you may be okay to take a little bit plus on, ge- on gestation, whereas if you're later on, you're going to try and pull that off. And then, you know, dairy farmers know their cows, they know what they're, they're going to work within a certain calvinese. So, again, within that, you have a range of bulls that you can work with. 
And it's about not just picking a high DBI bull, because a high DBI bull could have all his traits coming from the calving side of things and delivering absolutely nothing on the beef side of things. So you need to look at the sub-indexes within the dairy beef index and balance out the traits that you're chasing. So calving ease, um, gestation length, and then look for your beef characteristics after that. And I guess that relationship is not all a win for the beef farmer. There's a win there for the dairy farmer. If, if they use the right genetics that the beef farmer will come back and purchase those calves, they're in a stronger position then in terms of getting calves would say, a way off farm uh, in the springtime. Exactly. As well, Adam, we've got the CBVs coming on, on stream this spring as well. So, again, the more information that's in there, if year on year that dairy farmer's CBV, the CBV value of his calf is improving, well, then he's got a, a reason to try and look for more money for that calf. But, you know, it, it all, it'll work together. There's benefits on both sides, definitely. Okay, so I guess uh, calf protocol, once, once we come onto the farm, we're here this morning, nine calves arrived, uh, the trailer... And the was full of Jeep pulled into the yard nice and slowly, ramp let down, calves walked off a half an hour away, they just had to travel. The calves look well, the calves look healthy coming off the trailer. Take me through now with, with precision as regards what happens on this farm. The minute those calves now, they're on a straw bed here, it's, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. Take me through now what's going to happen in the next few days. Yeah, so if you take it, these calves were on the dairy farm this morning, were fed as they were for the last three weeks. They were then loaded up onto a clean trailer, taken nice and gently down the road. They're only on the, on the, on the trailer for maybe half an hour, 40 minutes, unloaded again and straight in, and you can see them, they're as happy as Larry here behind us. You know, there is a great benefit to that as well. That's worth a lot. These calves aren't stressed. There's been no long day, you know, out through a mart and back in, on a lorry and a couple of hours on a trailer. So all that is worth a lot. So these arrived in here, they'll be fed this evening. So if they were traveling further, we would probably say we'd need to go in with an electrolyte there this evening. But because they're only half an hour, 40 minutes on a the trailer. There's no massive loss in um, fluids there. So we're going to go back in now with a, with a milk feed this evening, um, probably two and a half litres or so. And then tomorrow morning, we might give them three. Um, no vaccination on arrival. Again, not that they are, but any stressed animal will not, a vaccination will not work on them. So we let them in, we let them settle today. Then we'll go in tomorrow evening maybe and we'll vaccinate them then so we're vaccinated. So no other treatments today as regards antibiotics or anything like that no. uh, as regards injections nothing at all just a, a straightforward milk feed this evening? Absolutely nothing. The calf bed was was ready for them to arrive it was already bedded there was straw in the rack there's clean water there you know we're, we're not going to annoy them again for the day that's just let them in let them get used to the new environment and settle in. So um, your first vaccination then, is that an intranasal vaccination or is it an injection? Yes, so pneumonia vaccination, intranasal, so we're PI3 and RSV. Why, why intranasal? We're getting a quicker response there to that. That's working probably after two or three days. So again, if we wanted to ramp this up onto the next level, this should probably be happening on the dairy farm prior to any moving at all. Obviously, there's a way to go to get to that level yet, but the next best thing is what we're doing here. Um, so, you know, after two or three days, we're going to have a, a kick in on, on, on that vaccination. And that's it really from a health protocol point of view at the moment. Uh, later on, they'll get their clostridial, a double dose of that, one month apart. Um, and then these are Anguses, so we've no issue here with this budding, but that would be done as well at four or five weeks um, at that stage. As regards concentrates, when, when do you start to introduce con And tell me a little bit about the milk replacer and the feeding rate um, and, and the mixing of that milk replacer. Yeah, it's something that we're going to change up slightly this year. You know, we've been doing a feeding protocol to the letter of the law here. Like, if it's, it's supposed to be 175 uh, grams per, day, per litre, that's what John Halley will feed them. You know, he's down to the last, the third decimal place, as I say. So, but... You know, we haven't been blown away with performance over the last few years in the calf rear and shed. We've been doing 0.75 to 0.8. For the level of attention and the facilities and everything that's going in, we would expect more. So we're going to change it up slightly this year. In terms of concentrate, that goes in again from, from arrival. We'll put in small amounts of fresh concentrate to try and get them started as soon as possible. We have been feeding six litres, three in the morning, three in the evening. And then from about five weeks on, we'd go to once a day feeding. Um, but this year we're going to pull back our total milk feeding. So again, looking at Chagas Research in Grange, 
they compared a four litre feed, total feed, two in the morning, two in the evening, versus an eight litre feed, four in the morning, four in the evening. Um, and there's huge savings there in terms of total amount of milk fed, but also in terms of calf performance. So you're going to feed, uh, in that trial, they fed about 26 kilos less uh, milk replacer, but they fed over 30 kilos more concentrate. So obviously you have more concentrate going in, um, but the concentrate is cheaper per kilo than, than your milk replacer. But if you think what that's doing, it's getting the room and going. So what Nicky Byrne would say is, the ones that were on the high level of feed of milk were only eating a kilo a meal by the time they were being weaned at 11, 12 weeks old, versus the ones that are on a lower level of milk, they were eating a kilo a meal by four weeks, five weeks old. So again, if you think these animals here behind us, the rumen isn't working in them at the moment. What our job, main job is over the next few weeks is getting that rumen kicked into gear. And you'll do that with concentrate. That's going to you know, rub off this, the walls of, of rumen and create these little papillae, these little like, finger-like projections that are going to increase the amount of absorption from the rumen. So that's what we're going to concentrate on this year, see if we can improve that uh, performance in, in the calf shed by trying to kick them over to ruminants quicker. You know, maybe we've been killing them with kindness nearly, you know, too much milk, slowing down that uh, change over to, the, to, a, to a concentrate or, or a forage-based diet. Once we wean them then, maybe they're getting too much of a shock and, you know, we're not getting the performance just when they go out to grass. So by changing it this year, we'll see how we go. Just finally, what's the target weight or is it an age that you wean on here or that you, you take them off milk? So, so again, we have a range of breeds. We have everything from Angus heifers up to Belgian blue bulls. So, you know, there's a fair range in weights as well at weaning, but you would be typically looking from 85 to 90 kilos, you would like to see them. Um, now, they're not all always that, but you know, again, we go more on if they're eating their kilo a meal consistently over a four or five day period, then we know that th that batch is ready to go. There'll always be maybe one or two within every batch of 30 that you'll say, right, they're not ready to go, and they'll just drop back into another batch for another next week uh, of feeding. And th any special tips on mi mixing milk replacer or a type of teat on a feeder, or is it all just keep things simple? Keep things simple, keep things clean. Um, hygiene is a huge one. Again, a lot of cases of bloat last year. Some of that's been put down to um, you know, level of hygiene. This was right across the country where we're hearing a lot of cases of bloat. But again, there was a lot of farmers, you know, maybe in their second year of rearing calves, where those teats changed between first year and second year, um, where they were correctly cleaned and stored all over the, the summer months. Um, so there's a whole heap of little things, and they all add up to, to improve the bigger picture. Okay. Okay, nice one again, guys. Uh, give us a good feel for the kind of the herd health side of things and the calf health side of things. Uh, Declan, you were talking about that kind of farm to farm sourcing and that linking up of farmers with each other, I suppose, in advance of actually a deal being done. Is there, is there, is there much that going on up around your neck of the woods? Like? I think there's more of it starting to happen, Jack. Um, there's probably not, an all, it's like a, on a national scale, it's probably not huge numbers, but I think every year there is more and more of it happening. Um, maybe something happening that I'd wish wouldn't happen until I got my calf sourced. But um, no, it is. It's look. It's what we want to to see, and uh, you know that feedback going back back between uh, beef farmer and dairy farmer. That's really important, and uh, you know it works for both sides from the beef farmer's point of view. They they build up a relationship with the dairy farmer. They know they're doing the whole classroom management correct. That side of things is all right. Then if they get some input into the, the beef sires that's been used on the herd, like that's invaluable going forward uh, for, for the beef farmer. And then from the dairy farmer's point of view, they know they have a customer there that's going to arrive and it's going to take every calf there in the shed on such a date. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a, that's a means a lot to them too. And do you hear much of it on kind of, on the you're obviously working a lot with, with dairy farmers. You know, do you hear a lot of that happening on the dairy farmer side of things? Is it, sorry, is it more prevalent, I suppose, than it was, let's say, a couple of years ago? I, I'm not sure if it is or not. Um, mm. Like, there's definitely a lot of farmers have their regular customers and they might have three or four lads that come every year and take, you know, whatever calves they have, whether they're Frisians or beef or whatever. Um, probably not as close as interaction as, as Declan was talking about there, but maybe it's growing. I'm, I'm not sure, but like those good calves, though, like, you know, there'll always be a buyer for them anyway. So it's probably more from the dairy farmer's point of view, he, he or she would probably be more kind to have a buyer for maybe his dairy bull calves as opposed to his dairy beef calves. Um, if that makes yeah. sense, you know, just in terms of no, because they're the ones that are harder to shift. Like you'd always sell a good herd. 
Yeah, you'll have Adam and Declan coming in cherry picking, like and and like I mean that's you want to sit, you want to sell what you what the pot's ready to go, like I mean so yeah, I mean it, it has to take it has to cut both ways, it has to take a bit of both, like yeah. I mean, Aiden, in terms of like the big one uh, and the, kind of the real next phase of this, as Declan was touching off, there is the breeding decision. So if Declan Marin came into Ed Brennan's farm and said, Aiden, I want to use ten of this Angus, ten of this uh, Hereford, and ten of these this Belgian Blues. I'd buy the calves off your boys or girls uh, this time next year. Will, will you do it? Like, you know, what's the kind of train of thought for a dairy farmer if he gets looking at these three sires? They're all plus 50 in DBI. They have a CBV to the sky. You know, I mean, what, what's the kind of train of thought? It's good for Declan. What's it like for the dairy farmer? Yeah. Well, once it's easy calving and short gestation, and like, you know, in fairness to DBI, that's, you know, you can I can identify that. You can see it. I, personally, and from who I talk to, I think, most farmers are happy enough with that kind of situation. Now, what we do, what I have my issues with is when they go around telling us then that we need to change the type of cow we have. Do you know, that for me is a different, is another, is another step that's maybe a step too far uh, in some cases. But um, like in terms of the sire, there's no issues. And I think the, it's up to the industry, it's up to ICBF and it's up to, you know, the eye companies to come up with these good bulls that are going to be short gestation and easy calving and that will deliver the high CBV, you know, on, on the sire side. But why, why is it a step too far? Regardless of what we do on DBI, um, DBI is not, I, I genuinely thought three years ago the DBI would save us here and we would be able to use DBI to, to get out of this problem. It's not gonna, it's not gonna help us. The, the beef merit of cows, the beef merit of dairy cows is continuing to drop. Um, and we're only yeah. treading water by using the, and we're not even embracing dairy farmers aren't embracing DBI. I'm looking here at the at the two highest bulls that used on the DBI mm-hmm. list, and it's it's Corn Luckton Lord Hardy at 50,000 inseminations and Sol Paul Kentucky Kid. Both bulls are negative for carcass. That's the highest bulls that we've used on the DBI list. Both bulls negative for carcass. That's no we're going nowhere with DBI if that's if that's the bulls we're using. But is there you see sorry, go on, is, yeah, no, go no, for it. Is, like I mean, is, is there much is there like for me? Like I don't see much of a value in it if because well, there is a value in it from the for, if you're selling, you know, if you're looking to get a, a good calf, right? Obviously, you're going to have if the figures are in front of you. But like the calf sale side of the dairy farmer's income is is so small. I mean, the the threat here, of course, is you know if something happens to the export market and you need to use more more beef bulls because you can't, you know, the, the Frisian bull calf can't be exported or you know there's less of a market for it anyway. We know that that's happening as as things are. But like, you know, it's just I, the, the buy-in isn't there for it. As Adam says, like he's, you're dead right. But I mean, why should we change the cow? Because the bread and butter in the dairy farmer is selling milk, and we have you know bred a cow that's delivering good milk solids, good fertility. Um, beef is a low, you know, it's in the EBI, but it's it's relatively low in terms of the weighting within that. Um, and there's a lot of people in the, in the industry who want to change that and make it a much greater emphasis in terms of beef. But for me, th- th- you know, the link then breaks between what's profitable and what's what, you know, in terms of and, and then looking at, at beef, which is sure, such a sure. tiny, a tiny factor on terms of dairy farmer income or gross out. Like, is that not going to come back to bite dairy farmers in the future in terms of there's so, so little thought of calves? Well, then there's no point in bothering here. That look at, but some somebody has to finish that calf. The beef farmer is dependent on that calf to be to be to have profitable genetics in it, you know. And and will there come a day where, where the beef farmer won't bother with these calves if 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 we keep getting burnt and we keep finishing heifers at at two thirty kilo calves and going into five pluses? Well, there'll come a day who will say, look at lads, we, we, there's no point in doing, you know. And will that? I'm 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 genuinely having a discussion. Here. I'm not I'm not trying to have a row. Like I'm only saying. Will there come a day then that, well, what, what do we do with these calves then, or, or where do we go with them? Like one third of one third of calves born in dairy farms are reared in dairy farms and, and brought to beef, you know. So there's a you, say, you know, the dairy farmer has a significant part to play, you know, has, yeah, yeah, skin yeah. in the game as well, you know, in, in terms of what the, what the herd is and all the rest. I mean, the profitability side of it. You know, I haven't seen that, and now maybe I'm I'm just not looking the right place, but I haven't seen that to say that the high DBI. Um, calf has got a is delivers more profit for the beef farmer. I I just don't know is that there. Like I I, I haven't seen. Actually, it. There, well, there is there's, there, Declan come in there. Maybe Declan, you know more. But there is there is a lower there's a lower percentage of them out out of spec in terms of confirmation and, and in terms of um we'll say lower weight. You know, in terms of high DBI bulls or breeding cattle that are there's less of them coming in out of spec. I suppose in in the factory 
Um, yeah. So 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 it's a volume thing, you know. It's it's yield. The yield of meat in those cars is higher. But like, yeah, but there's, a huge, the yield, there's, but, but there's a huge penalty to to being out of spec within a beef finishing system. If we're if we're finishing animals that are on their weight, uh, once we're losing out on bonuses, or we're finishing animals that are coming in at peas instead of ours, we're well, minus twenty four, minus thirty, minus thirty six cent on the grid. So there's a massive negative to that, you know. Yeah, look, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm all up for, for, for delivering a good calf and, and dairy farmers are all up for delivering a, a good calf to beef farmers so that they'll make a profit and make a turn. On it. And I mean, like, that's, you know, that's a given at this stage. Uh, my only concern is that there's some people in the, in the industry want us to effectively go and milk flex fees, you know, a dual purpose cow or uh, some sort of a, a, a you know, a, a very low or yielding, uh, you know, in terms yeah, of milk yeah. solids into profitable traits for in terms of milk, just because we can get a, a good beef calf of it. Sure. No surely, is there is there not a halfway house between the fleck fee and the and the Jersey extreme Jersey cow? Like uh, well, now we're not talking about Jersey, you know. I mean, <laughs> no, you're you're picking the extremes, like yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I, I think there no, is. I'm not Adam, talking about fleck fees either. I'm not talking about fleck no. fees either. Yeah, no, no, Asher, no, no, and you don't have to be. No, I mean, but the majority of Frisians like can deliver a decent calf. Like, I mean, what what Declan and what you're buying on on the Triumph program, I'm sure they're they're all coming from from Frisian cows. Um, uh, you know, they're, yeah, they're, you they're, know, they're, they're high EBI yeah. hosting Frisian cows. Like that, they, we're not uh, selecting. Like it's not going to monopoly a British Frisian cow or anything like that. Mm. Um, so from that, but like, but they have, they have. Yeah. A, I, I know some of the herds contributing to it, and they have a very, a relatively low maintenance figure, which indicates that they're bigger cows. And I mean, maintenance for me is a proxy for size, and size mm. is a proxy for intake, and intake is a proxy for you know efficiency. Mm. And like you mm. know, those larger cows are just less efficient, like. Uh, mm. They take more more feed to, to maintain themselves. Um, you know they're not suitable for wet ground. You know there's a whole load of issues with them that we've had. You know the industry has moved away from. Yeah. I suppose for the last forty years. But, but we 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 come back to this whole breeding piece. I think there's a, it'll come to, towards the end when we when we do a bit of a kind of a wrap up on things again. I want just want to come back on the the animal health on the video that we just saw. I mean, Declan, in, in terms of the the intranasal piece, like I mean. You you said you got acting you got to act in faster like with the Adamastia, I think why you use an intranasal and I think you said it acts faster. I mean, were, were you seeing symptoms in calves like we'd say when 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 you were putting when you were putting the intranasal up like I mean you talk about a quicker response like were you, were you seeing symptoms in those calves that had there were a couple of days on the farm? We we do get some uh, touches of pneumonia in, in the sheds down there, all right? Um, nothing too serious, but look, we just we want to get coverage as quick as possible, Jack. It, like as I said, when we're bringing in from multiple sources, um, yeah. in, during changeable weather and all that, we want to have everything on our side that we can. So that's why we just went with that. But it, it's fair to say so that you're using it as preventative more so than than a than a treatment. Like, like I know plenty of farmers like we say that have they're bringing in 30, 40, 50 cows from all different sources. Again, even more sources I said than what you're getting. You know, they're they're coming back with ones and twos from the market instead of instead of nines and tens. You know, and um, they're not doing any they're not doing any of that. Like, but you know, you're doing it as a preventative piece. Absolutely, yeah. No, look, it's an it's an insurance policy. Um, John Halley himself, you know, there's what if we can change plenty of things, but if I suggested that, that is not one thing he would change. You know, he would say that a vaccinated calf is much easier to cure. Uh, if there is a touch of pneumonia, like they'll, they'll come back around a lot quicker. Um, okay, it's a cost of the system, but it's an insurance policy, and uh, I think it's well worth it, you know, in terms of it could be, you know, that little extra bit of performance too. If there's no strain or no um, issues in, in the shed, it's, it's well worth it. Okay, and then you're coming in with a black leg to uh, an initial an initial shot and a booster shot, and that's it. Then so, what's the cost per calf, uh, Declan, of the of the whole job is five six euros, is it or what? what, what? Uh, no, for so up to we're about uh, 15, 16 euro up to um, the end of the weaning phase. Um, so we're also going in this year with a with a coccidiosis treatment. We had a, an outbreak which we'll hear about later on of coccidiosis in in the weanlands um so we hadn't been doing precoxidiosis up to now so we'll probably put that in probably when they go out to grass for two weeks we'll probably dose at that stage um just to cover us from that side of things but that's the only thing we're going to change this year uh, and the the micropacer piece is interesting in terms of you know switching over from the kind of i call it the, the traditional kind of three and three into um you know the you know the, the trial that, that that Nikki Burns trial in terms of four liters versus eight liters and ended up with the same kind of net weight, albeit that there was more meal consumed than milk replacer. But like given the price of milk replacer versus meal, I mean it's 
it's it's well worth it. You know, it's ten times like the, the ton of the ton of microplaster is ten times or ten times the it's it's of the of the ten times the price of the of the meal, isn't it? Like I mean, it's, it's yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm a big fan of those lower lower milk intake um kind of wheat rearing systems, and obviously to eat more meal then. But as as Declan said, it's you know it's it's good for the room and development to be eating more meal at that age. Uh, it's also good from the blow point of view, like Declan mentioned it as well. But like those high intakes of milk and milk replacer, um, particularly milk replacer, they're high risk for bloat, like and you know losing a few good of those good calves now would be would be bad like yeah um the other one in in terms of the weaning weight uh, Declan again talked about 85 90 for those kind of beef type sired uh calves I mean in terms of dairy replacements that could be this it's not hugely different like no and I was if you're the freezing ones would probably be be heavier you know the, the target there is kind of 100 kilograms but then those that are doing the, the lower um the less meal or sorry less milk and you know that the four four liters of milk per day let's say sometimes they will carry on the ad lib meal for a little bit longer if they might they might wean them at, at 80 or 90 kilos they carry on the ad lib meal until they're 100 kilos and then they're weaned off the, the meal you know as well you know they'd be at grass at that stage but um yeah like you know you can overdo the the whole milk thing as well i know there's a lot of talk but you know in, in the in the heifer side in the dairy heifer side particularly you know that some people are feeding up to six and seven uh, liters and eight liters in some cases like for me that does it it doesn't really make sense because you only want the heifer to go and calf now i know this is a different game you know the earlier finishing is 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 important from a cost point of view um and ultimately profit aiden the six semen uh, like i see some farmers using three weeks of six semen they use six six dairy uh, they'll get the replacements and then they switch straight away over onto beef do you reckon we'll see more of that like in the in the coming years as six semen becomes more prevalent yeah big time uh you're going to see this, see this year already uh, yeah, in the farmer's journal tomorrow I've, I have a good report there from a farmer in mayo uh crossbred herd again he's trying to improve the value of his calves uh so he's uh, you know he's going to use uh, 100 sex straws across his cows and his heifers he knows the cows already they're going to get it everything else is going to get um well there's a few conventional straws in but the majority of everything else is getting a beef ai a high dbi atom uh beef ai uh bull so um he's going to maximize the, the value of his calves and as well to that Adam, I mean, those beef type calves, as we talked about, whether they're early or late or whatever. I mean, is there is there a place for the, the later born calves? Now, we'll, we'll say what's later, like they're, they're, we'll call them April, April born calves. Is there is there a place for them in, in this type of a system or is is it a different is it, is it a different like maybe if they were store, if they were selling in stores in in the second in the second year, you know, those beef type, type calves might be ideal. Yeah, there there is Jack. I suppose the thing here, not to get caught in, I suppose, is is, is in a halfway house that you that you maybe come in for that second winter uh, and you end up trying to finish them out of the shed for that second winter because there certainly isn't money in that in terms of trying to finish those dairy beef animals out of the shed. You you probably try and store over that second winter and just maybe silage only or very small amount of concentrates and go back to grass again then and try and finish off grass again. Or what you've said there, there is a definite market and a funny enough factory line feedlots will be very very active at the moment for those uh, sort of store animals store angus and store herifers and I look mm. at that's playing the market a little bit in terms of they need supplies of them for, for i guess april and may this year so they're very very active at the moment so they're those guys are getting very well rewarded at the moment for those store angus and herifers uh, that were born you know in in early spring in 2021 or even back in 2020 at the moment in terms of the mart ring but yeah I, I just winter finishing probably isn't isn't a game to put to be out with these cattle it's it's um it's definitely off grass Right, folks, email your questions to webinar at farmersjournal.e or WhatsApp 086-836-6465. We'll take a break for a minute. Back to you then. Hi, my name is Kieran Lanahan. I'm a technical specialist with Chanel Veterinary. So as farmers, we all know the symptoms of coccidiosis, that bloody black scour, animal straining. But I suppose what's not very well known out there is the subclinical effect of coccidiosis. So researchers say that only about 1 in 25 animals that's carrying a heavy infection of coxy in their system will display those symptoms that we know very well as farmers. The rest of the animals in that group of 25 are just going to be wasting energy trying to fight off the parasite in their system. And that's energy that should be going on their back as growth. So if we have an animal in the group with clinical coccidiosis symptoms, we then adopt a docile approach. So the guide to anticoccidials is to go in 10 to 14 days after the animal has entered a high risk environment. But in reality, a high risk environment is everywhere on a farm because coxie, as I said, are everywhere. Alternatively, we can use farm history to design our treatment protocol. And that would mean going in around seven days in advance of when we expect clinical coccidiosis based on what's happened in the past.
Right, folks, we're heading back to the demo farm for our uh, final video. We'll have a quick look at this and then we'll come back to the studio for a final wrap up session. But this time we're not looking at calves, we're looking at the yearling cattle. Um, let's take it away. Okay, Declan, we're here with the yearling cattle. So these cattle behind us were born in spring 2021, so they're the calves basically one year on. Tell me a little bit about them and I suppose the, what has happened these calves and what has happened them over the winter time. Yeah, so I suppose we've chatted about the rearing phase there for the calves once they go to grass. With this batch last year, we decided to leave in a kilo of meal all the way through. The previous year, we just fed the 40 lightest calves uh, one kilo a day to keep kind of bring them up to the average weight. Last year, we decided that, you know, that extra performance we were getting from that kilo, we thought was worth it, so we left it in. Um, and was it worth it? I can't tell you that until we get through to, to slaughter, but look, we are, <clears throat> we are slightly ahead um, weight-wise right now than we were this time last year. So the bullocks are currently 355 kilos, the heifers are about 335. Um, What's the target at this stage of the year for, for people at home watching, I guess, or maybe weighing yearlings going back out to grass? Now, what's, what's the ta what would you like to have them at? Yeah, I suppose for bullocks heading out maybe that 10th to the 17th of March, I'd like them 360 kilos. Um, heifer's going to be 20 kilos lighter. That uh, would be ideal. And where's your points then along the way? Like, <coughs> if you were doing another weigh-in, like, wh where, where do you want them to be sort of hitting 500 kilos? Or? Yeah, so we'll, we'll be weighing them fairly often because we're doing a bit more but say on a commercial farm I'd like to see them weighed again probably in early July and then um, maybe uh, towards the end of August again and and typically we, we weigh so we'll weigh the end of July early August and we'll make a decision then on what we we'll start to feed at that stage so any heifers kind of over the 450 kilo mark or 470 kilo mark we'll start feeding at that stage any bullock over 490 500 kilos we'll start feeding and then that's further away we leave on grass a little bit longer because with these type of animals they tend to go over fat too quick if you put too much concentrate in too soon so leaving them on grass only they'll kind of grow a bit more and then we'll put in the concentrate at a later stage so tell me how will these be managed at grass and what's the target turnout date for the cattle behind us Given the weather, the turnout date has probably been pushed back, but look, we'd hope to be out in the next, you know, by the 9th of March, I'm hoping that we'll be saying, yeah, we're out at grass. Um, there's loads of grass on farm, but, you know, we have the inf infrastructure on this farm to go out by day and come in at night. It's not very replicable uh, on a national scale. You know, we can do it, but we probably, once we go out, we'd like to stay out if we can. We don't mind bringing them in if we have to, but once we go, we'd like to be able to stay out. So, lo as I said, loads of grass on farm, so keen to get them out as soon as possible. To get this covers out there, probably 1,300, 1,400 at this stage. I'd like to get them cleaned off definitely um, the next couple of weeks um, so that, you know, you're, you're kicking on growth then again for that. You have found a bit of an issue there in the first couple of weeks going to grass that you don't have a huge demand, I suppose, on a dairy, and it's very applicable on a dairy calf to any dairy calf to be mm -hmm. farm. How are you overcoming that here on this farm? So I suppose we're learning from our mistakes as well. So previously we would have gone out in early spring and grazed the silage ground, trying to uh, get that grazed off before closing. Um, but what we found then is by the time we got onto our grazing ground, it was already ahead of us, and we we're actually bailing some of the grazing ground in the first rotation. So. Last autumn, we left out these uh, heifers up until the 10th of December, the last of them came in, and they're out on the silage ground. So that was bare coming in. So we don't need to graze that this spring. We can go straight to the grazing ground. We're gonna close the silage ground straight off. We'll have an earlier cut of silage. We'll be fit to cut silage by the 15th of May if, if growth and weather allows. Um, so that'll overcome that side of things. Um, then in terms of gra grazing management for these, they'll be moving probably on average three times a week. And that's the kind of the rate they need to be going at them. They need to be getting fresh grass every two, three days um, to maintain performance. You know, perform grassland management is fairly good on the farm. We're measuring grass. We're going into the right kind of covers. Um, and still, when you look at a full grazing season, if you get that kilo a day, average daily gain, it's as good as it's going to get. Over the winter period, what has been the diet and what has been the health treatments that these <coughs> cattle behind us have received? So, again, in terms of growth rate, we're probably a little bit more than your typical store diet because we're, we're trying to kill these animals off grass at the end of the season. Um, we need them to be doing that little bit more than your 0 0.6, 0 0.65, so we're aiming for between 0.8 and 0.9. Um, this year, the, the silage quality was slightly lower, still 70 DMD, still probably 
you know, above average quality silage, but we had to feed two kilos a meal, whereas in other years we'd only just feed one over the winter with 75 DMD silage. So we have a higher concentrate bill this winter, but they have been performing. They've been doing 0 0.85, 0 0.86 over the winter period, so happy with that. Um, then in terms of health protocols, so they would have been uh, worm dosed, you know, we'd be fecal egg counting, we'd be worm dosing all through the summer as needed. Once they came in for a few weeks, they got a, another worm dose just to clean them out. Uh, no fluke on this farm, so not an issue on that side of things. Um, had an issue with coccidiosis actually after we housed them. It was probably the change in weather, change in environment, change in diet. We got a slight outbreak in coccidiosis. We had the vet out, Tom Julian. We dung sampled animals. Yes, it was coccidiosis. And we were going to treat everything, but he said, hold off. And this was in Wienlands. This yeah. was in sort of strong cattle. You wouldn't normally associate coccidiosis infections with, with maybe, no. what, they were up at, what, a 250, 280 kilos? Yeah, well, yes, exactly. Yeah, they're probably even more. Yeah, 280, 290 kilos. So, as Tom explained it to me, um, the oocytes that cause coccidiosis, are, they're everywhere all the time. And it's just when a, a stress comes on the system that you can get that build up then. And then when they're inside and, you know, maybe not as clean, that, that was being passed from animal to animal a lot easier. Was well, that quite expensive to treat them? Because that's on a weight basis, isn't it, in terms of a treatment for coccidio? Well, yeah, we actually didn't treat for it. He said, hold off a few days. He said the stress caused it, but he said once they overcome that little bit of stress, then maybe they could come clear again. So he said, we'll just hold off a day or two. And he was dead right. Um, within, I was worried that if we didn't treat, we're yeah. going to lose performance. Yeah. But, you know, I was down the next week and there was... The way we, we found it was... There was uh, I was going to say, how did you identify yeah. it and how did you confirm it? So the way we found it was, it's all cubicles here, so we saw where the animals would be dunging on the back of the cubicle that was like fr uh, fresh blood. And you might say, oh, well, maybe a heifer bullen or that, but this was, you know, more... Yeah. more uh, you know, there's plenty of it around the place to say that it was more than just a heifer bullen. So that's what first um, alerted us to the situation. Then called out to Tom, he came out, he looked at them, there was only maybe three or four showing clinical signs. Um, the rest were fine. And then, um, so he took a dung, a dung sample that time from the, the animals showing signs, and then we took a pool sample from everything else as well. When he looked at the results from that, he said they weren't actually that high that he would be worried about going, you know, at such a level that we needed to go in and, and, and treat. So he said, give it a few days, and, and that did work. As I said, I was worried that we'd lose performance. We're going on our January weigh-in. Um, we definitely didn't okay. lose any performance. Finally, in terms of these cattle going to grass, what sort of health treatments are when you're going with a first worm dose? Will you go in a fecal sample or what's the, what's the plan? The fecal there? sample as well, but like um, once they're into the yearling stage, I think last year we got away with maybe just one worm dose to the, to the yearling cattle last year. I wouldn't expect a huge burden on these. You know, they, they've built up a bit of resistance there. Um, and is the plan the same for this year in terms of trying to push as many animals as we can on this farm off grass as regards the animals behind us? For this group, yes. So we're going to stick with the same system. We kind of know what's going to happen already, Adam. We know that we're going to kill probably 80% of our heifers off grass um, and probably 50% of our bullocks. Go within that then, we'll probably kill 75% of our early maturing animals and probably less than 50% of our late maturing animals. So do we maybe bite the bullet earlier in the autumn and say those late maturing animals, animals we're not going to finish them off grass, let's put them in and, and put them on a higher concentrate diet earlier. On the flip side of that, if we can keep the mouse gaining, <clears throat> um, you know, okay, doing okay average daily gains on a grass-based diet, typically you see beef price rise as we head for Christmas. Are we better aiming them, trying to get them in there, in then with five or six weeks of feeding just before that? So that's a decision to, to still to be made. But for the majority of them, um, aiming for that, like we're, the idea of the program is to hit a 300 kilo carcass at between 19 and 20 months of age. And when you take your average of your Bullocks and heifers, yes, we can do that. Our bullocks last year were 308, and the heifers were about 270. So obviously your heifers are going to be lighter and with more early maturing as well. So that's the plan for this year. Then going to the calves that we've just bringing in currently, we're going to change it up slightly, maybe look at can we reduce the overall concentrate input into those animals' lifetime? Um, is there a role for maybe uh, more clover in the diet, red clover silage, things like that we're going to look at over the next few months. Okay. Take the nice uh, warm looking yearlings, DG. What's the, what, was the, what was the crack with grass in the last week? Yeah, we got them out on the 1st of March, Jack, um, which was great. That was just um, the next probably four days after we, we shot that, there was snow. Uh, fall and, and, and sleet showers the day we were down filming that 
And four days later, five days later, we were letting out cattle to grass. Um, there'd been a lot of drying over the weekend and um, we decided to bite the bullet and get them out. Now, unfortunately, there was more snow today, so they had to go back in again today. Um, heavy snow this morning in, in South Tip. But uh, like that's going to be, um, you know, a minor blip. I'd say they'll be out again by, by Monday at the latest, hopefully. And I think a better week forecast for next week. So um, the, the main objective now is trying to get grazing off. You know, we've got, we've got a lot of grass on the farm to try and get some of that grazed off. Um, I spoke there about not wanting to graze the silage ground. The silage ground there that was grazed in November, that's got slurry in, in mid-January and has probably a cover of maybe a thousand kilos there on it. So what do I do? Do I leave it and go for a real early cut of silage or, or do we try and get that nipped off in the next fortnight and then get it closed up? So we, we're probably going to graze it, I would say, but um, it's, it's a difficult one to know what to do when there's nearly too much grass on the farm. Um, have many of the other farms uh, stock out yet, uh, Declan? No, again, um, a lot of them would have been thinking about it there last weekend, but looking at the forecast, some of the guys up here in the West would have um, so heavy rain coming in there for uh, Tuesday night and into Wednesday morning. And I was talking to a few of them and, you know, they were kind of geared up to go on Saturday. But with, if that wasn't in the forecast, they would have gone. Um, so hopefully they'll get out, you know, maybe this weekend or, or next week. Um, Adam, like in, in, in terms of the, the cattle that we're looking at there in, in that short piece of DT, like they're, I mean, so they're all going to come to finish uh, starting September. Uh, October, I think the Dickens say eighty percent of the heifers like will will be gone um at, around that time. You know what's what's the the outlook for beef price over the next few months? Um, yeah, know, I suppose, for, those, for those type of cattle. I suppose Jack, there would have been maybe at the beginning of the year we would have been worried a little bit about more pressure coming on at that time of the year because it'd be somewhat of a recovery across the UK, maybe and even in Ireland in terms of numbers. Um, would say more beer estimating numbers will recover by up to eighty thousand in twenty twenty two. So we'll expect some pressure at some point. The good thing is that given the demand for beef at the moment is we're up actually twenty five thousand already um, in the first eight weeks or or, or nine weeks of twenty twenty two. So that means that if we get all of those out of the system early on in the year when the demand is there, well, that'll take less. I suppose it'll take more of the pressure off towards the, the grass time. And look, at there always come factories used, I suppose, coming off grass and, and, and that pressure that, that, that aligns with maybe August, September finishing off grass. They use that to pull back the price. But hopefully this year, given that we're up already on numbers, that'll pull back some of the pressure for the back end of the year. And I, I, it'll be pretty positive. I don't. It's a long way to go, Jack, from where we are at the moment back down to, to where we are were last year. Okay, um, nice one, right, folks? I have lots of questions coming in here on um, the various bits and pieces that we've covered throughout tonight. I want to get through some of them. I know, Dick, that you want to give us a, a slide on the economics, but I might take a couple of questions first, and then we might tee up the, the, the slide on the, on the economics of the system. For Aidan, um, Tom Costello and Kerry, what is it costing a dairy farmer per week to feed a calf at the moment? Uh, per week, well, sure. Um, let's do. Let's work it out. Like, sure, if milk is fifty cent, and uh, you're feeding six, well, five, four a day. Let's say, uh, yeah. that's two euro a day. So two yeah, 14, day, 15 seven, euros. 14, yeah. yeah, fourteen if you're on that. And a lot of them would be a lot of farmers would be feeding a lot more. So it could go up to 20, 20 euros a day. Like, so that's what's yeah, plus, plus straight, straight plus milk your, alone. Yeah. yeah, plus your meal, plus your straw, plus your labour. Yeah. Um, another one for Aidan, Jerry in Galway. It's not as simple to say that there is money to be made from buying those calves at Fiverr and sell them again at 90. I have bought those calves before and it takes them a long time to hit any type of weight. I think the recommendations for weaning calves off meal, turning out, etc., needs to be separated for depending on the type of calf that you're that you're dealing with. So yeah, that's that's for that quick sale. If you're looking like, like that's that's that you know that's that's unusual, I call it like people buying for that quick sale, unless they're dealers, like isn't that fair to say? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And I, I'm not um, saying that's what they should do, but if you are looking for you know to make profit out of it, maybe they're the calves that are going to make more profit. Yeah. Derek in Limerick is commercial beef value being considered in which calves to purchase in the Thrive program. Are you using the CBV for purchase decisions, Derek? Uh, we're not currently. We're going to, you know, we're, we're buying in. We're going to look at the CBVs then once we have everything in. Um, hopefully next year, you know, CBVs will definitely be much further on and we'll also have more information. That's right. That's an old available yeah, to thank us. You. Yeah. That's all I wanted. Yeah. <laughs> um, CBV, CBV, Jack, without DNA registration is not worth the, the, the paper is wrote on. We, we we can't, there's no point. We've jumped yeah. the gun on this one as regards CBVs. We should be we should be DNA verifying all cows before we go with a CBV. It's it's, it's okay. Nice one. Yeah. Um there's been a number of indexes introduced in recent years, and all are bring are 
bring different changes? Should there be a figure on sires for days to slaughter that is easily followed? You know, so instead of the index piece, is there a figure on sires for days to slaughter that is easily followed and people might understand it or farmers might understand it? What do you think of that one? Yeah, I guess the carcass weight, I suppose, within that in terms of we'll give you maybe a, a figure based on what the genetic potential of that animal is. And I guess the, 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 the better the carcass weight maybe for that animal, the, you'd, you'd imagine maybe the quicker the finish. Um, also, they'll add a spec pieces as well maybe you could link back to, to just order but i guess that's the way it's going maybe in terms of index maybe the way they, they should go and in terms of carbon footprint of that animal that could feed in maybe and, and direct us to more efficient animals yeah for for, for slaughter and early okay and there's one there on meat powder i'll come back to it uh, you might cover off that in the in the in the economic slide uh, declan so i'll hold that um Aiden is right if beef farmers don't want our calves then it's simple don't buy them I'll take that as a comment what happens with the calves in chavez they are being pushed they're pushing the crossbreeding agenda for years surely they've been finished on chavez farms to identify the most economic way of finishing these calves all the talk on efficiency of these calves versus progeny from Holstein for regions, Flexby, British regions is just opinion without hard facts. Uh, Aidan, do you know where them? Uh, yeah, the they're, going, they're, going, they're going up to Declan's country, they're going to the north, northwest. Uh, they're being controversial up there, and I actually did a report on it last year. Uh, so we'll have to, we'll have we should have uh, slaughtered that. I, I think on, on I think the now. first of them, I think the first of them are being slaughtered at the moment, actually. I think, mm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, nice one. We constantly hear the beef farmer setting price for calf based on his final margin. No mention how a better price needs to be achieved based on what the, that animal costs at all stages. To make a good calf, the source is key. And with all this new data, there's still nothing extra for the good dairy farmer. Why not have the factory reward a good grading animal with a small reward per animal to the primary breeder stroke dairy farmer? It might be a 10, 20 euro per good carcass, but it connects the dairy farmer to the entire process. Ah, here so, for good. Look, now look, gee, take, who, who sent it? Aiden, I'll take that. Aiden, I'll take that. Aiden, I'll push that. We'll push that. At the ministerial the level, please, God, we'll have an answer <laughs> next week. Like, thank you very much. The okay. The light, what was the line? Um, based on the cost, based on the costs that are associated. Oh, wouldn't you love no, to live in, no, wouldn't you love to but, live in that but, world? Great. Add, add, no, Adam, you're looking at more. Widen the lens a little bit. No. What, what, what he's saying is, like what he's saying, and he or she, I don't know who it is, but like, I mean, in terms of the connection, like to kind of bring a reward for the final product so that there is, you know, because I mean, he, as he's, he, like the question is right, like the source calf is important. That's what you are saying, like, you know, and so to, for the farmer to recognize that, that breeds that animal and gets the, you know, when you, when the beef finisher goes to get that uh, premium or whatever you say, that, that added value. That it, some of it, the some of that, a share of that is passed back. Like it's 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 not a bad thing to link up the circle. Like it's not a, it's a, it'd, it'd be a, be a, it'd, a dangerous it'd way be a, to go. Yeah. It might be a negative figure at the end of it. If it was a profit share at the end of the system, it might be yeah, a bill yeah. coming in rather than a check. Yeah, but it, but again, it, it it does tie it back. I, I, you're right, like you know what I mean. But it, it, there's there's lessons in it because I mean, at, yeah, we, we 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 might come back to it. Um, are any farmers in the program located in the Midlands and West where turnout is more like 10th to the 15th of April and housing could be as early as mid-September? I presume these systems are not a runner for dairy beef. So uh, Dick can take that where they are, where, where they're located. Yeah, so we're right across the country really, but we're probably some of the lads on the hardest ground are in one in, in Castle Island, Kerry, very difficult ground. Um, a couple of lads in Mayo that probably, you know, that bit shorter grazing period as well. So um look what we're doing on Hallies they probably can't do but you know the best of them are are you know on our on our coattails there they would be still um you know focusing on the basics you obviously admitting or, or um saying okay I have limitations on my farm but putting a system in place that best suits that farm so again the guys in in the tougher ground um, are going for those Angus heifer type systems, um, Hereford heifer type systems, mm. where get their lighter, smaller animals that can probably um, get them way off grass at the end of the grazing season. You know, they can start killing in, in August time when ground conditions be better. Whereas if they're on bullocks, you probably be into late September, October when you know they might not be able to be at grass at all. So they've kind of worked that into the system. They're the ones that really want this early born on calf, um, Jack, because. Yeah. Um. In order to be able to do that, they have to have that early one cap. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. So the so the but in fairness, the systems are a runner for dairy. Like though the, the system that you're trying to trying to develop there, it is a runner for dairy beef in those occasions to get them the but you need to get the, the pieces right in the jigsaw. Um. What rate milk powder in two liters? So we talked about two liters morning and evening. I think uh, four liters a day. 
what rate milk powder in the two liters? Anyone know that one? It's typically around 175 grams per per liter, but it'll depend on, on the on the back of the bag. I'd say for most of them anyway, but um, yeah. you're typically looking at 175 grams per liter. Of, uh, okay, so the the powder is going in. Uh, how soon can I feed cold milk to calves? I'm tired of bringing buckets of hot water from the house to the shed. Um, in um, talk to me on that one, or Dick well, and whoever. Personally, at home, I don't ever feed cold milk to calves. I, I never feed uh, warm milk. Um, and the, look, the only the issue, look, that's that's whole milk. In fairness, uh, there is a, it's it's a bit different with a milk replacer. So you do need warm milk, mm. warm Thanks. water for milk replacer um, to break down some of the the proteins uh, and you know to, to dissolve it fully. Um, but it doesn't have to be that hot, you know. I mean, it, like lukewarm water will do it. Um, you know, 30, 30 degrees, I suppose. Declan, I, I, any of the guys switching over to cold quick? Uh, Adam, have you got have you, you switching to no, cold and, quick? Yeah. No, I just I know guys that's been maybe one of those little gas heaters, Jack, 350 euros or 400 euros, you know, up on the wall, gas canister in the shed, really, really useful and, and you know, worth the money in terms of, uh, you know, lugging buckets of water across real the... Real fancy, across, real yeah. fancy, like real fancy. for uh, Instant hot water, like a Burko, yeah. a Burko boiler works as well. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But anyway, look at the, 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 the... When you have the money in Kevin, you might as well spend it. Um, <laughs> but what is the best housing for calves, huts or sheds? Aidan, talk to me. Um, there's no ideal housing for calves, and that needs to be said. Like, I, I mean, the natural environment for a calf is is tucked under the cow, um, and and you know it's very hard to replicate that kind of uh, the care that the cow will give the calf relative to what you know it's going to get in the shed. Um, probably the ideal thing is 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 some of those kind of igloos. I think are probably probably close enough to being the best ones. Now they're very expensive. They're different to hutches as well. Um, it kind of creates a little microclimate inside them, and some people even put them. We'll say within a bigger shed, you know, so it's not they're not exposed. Um, look, look, most far, most sheds, most new build sheds are, are the wrong type of shed for calves. They're great sheds for multi-purpose store and straw during the summer uh, and whatever else, but they're not ideal for calves. They're too cold. There's no there's no stack effect. Um, and actually, those old style sheds, you know, the ones you know in like a, an old stable or cow house or whatever, they're probably better from a calf health point of view, but they're an awful dose to clean out. And um and they can get a bit stuffy in fairness at times too. But there's no right and wrong, you know. There's no well, there's plenty wrong, but there's there's very little right. You see some guys, Jack, they might be putting up maybe two bales, two round bales of straw into the back. You know, we generally maybe have the mono pitch sheds, you know, single sided sheds, mm. and again, they're great for ventilation, as Aiden says, but very bad for cows. But some guys are putting in maybe two bales into a bay, putting a couple of plywood boards across the top of that, maybe straw, and creating a little yeah. microclimate within. Right. It's really, really yeah. good and warm for calves, you know, if, if people were Does going into that. Keep the drafts off. Keep the yeah. drafts off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, do Is there an open day coming up on the farm in Tipperary? Yeah, so we're on um, August, it's the 18th, I think Adam, isn't it? The 18th. Oh, tor- tours of the 18th of August, yeah. 18th of August, Thursday, yeah, on, on August. John Halley's there. So um, okay. we will nice. hopefully have big crowds in on the farm that day. Nice one. Do the panel think we need to develop a veal system in Ireland as live exports won't continue? Uh, you would imagine sending cows to the factory at less than six weeks isn't a good image for the industry either. So uh, a veal system in Ireland, do the panel think we need to develop one? Uh, look, I'll jump in there for us. We don't have a history of veal systems in Ireland, Jack. I suppose it's something maybe Chagas should look at. I think we do need to be modelling in the system or modelling or looking at what will happen in five years' time if we get a letter from Brussels to say that there's no more live exports of young calves. How do we change our systems? Have we have we rearing facilities on dairy farms to keep these calves? Have we rearing facilities on beef farms to keep these calves? I don't think live exports is going to last. I think it will definitely come under pressure in the future. We're, we're on bought time at the moment. I don't know what Aidan thinks, but I, I think, yeah, I'm not too sure is the veal system going to work here um, in terms of, look, we'd be exporting it all. Oh, we're not saying other countries that do veal systems export their product out as well, but um, it just it takes some research and a bit of thought. That one, I'd say, we don't have the calvin pattern to match it. You know, most no. of those veal yeah. units don't. They, they they kind of get three or four crops in a, in a year, yeah. in and out, kind of for so long. Aidan, any any ideas, any thoughts on the veal system? Oh, like you'd have to, as you said there, you'd have to link it up with an existing kind of uh, someone that's doing it in in Holland or Spain or wherever it is at the moment, and just do that do that run in in Ireland for the spring rather than bringing them over there. And you have the route to market then, but sure, it's, it's you know it's 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 marginal game now to be honest. But um, I suppose yeah. if it helps, the, if they, it helps, need, they need the less. Numbers. They need less than six percent jersey genetics as well. They've, they've they've said that this week in Bannon. Nice one, um, uh, Declan. You have a couple of slides on the economics of the systems um, last year, like so. These are real numbers on the real systems. You know, are the real cattle that 
that went through the system last year. Are, we, are you going to give us a slide on that? Or are you going to talk us through it? Yeah, yeah, no, I just want to. So this this was actual figures from from the uh, the demonstration farm there, and this was the most profitable system. This is our early maturing steers or Angus and Herford steers. So they would have been purchased, bought and purchased in 2020 and slaughtered in the back end of 21. Um, so just running through it quickly, calf price was an average of 196 euro, um, transport in onto the farm, 10 euro, milk replacer 66 euro. So that's 1.6 bags of milk replacer we were feeding on average um, to a calf. And then uh, meal feeding, so that's just from arrival through to once they were weaned and out to grass was 18 euro. Uh, other rearing costs such as straw 12 euro per head um, our vets that's our clostridial vaccine or pneumonia vaccine and any other bits of drugs that would be used on the farm uh, average out at 12 euro per calf um, giving us a total variable rearing cost of 314 euro so grazing cost then for the first and second season coming at 213 euro our concentrate for the first winter and the finishing period coming at 232 euro um, and then the silage for the first winter, no, obviously second winter period for these animals. Uh, so a silage cost of 92 euro. Vet from, from the end of the weaning phase right through. So we win actually with another pneumonia vaccination there in pre-housing. Um, and so, um, and then uh, whatever dose, however that is, is included in, in on that. Haulage and kill charges, 34 euro. So a to total variable cost from the wean into the second grazing seat to the end is uh, 583. So total variable cost then over on the right hand side, 897 euro to bring that animal right through the system. Uh, we had an average carcass weight of 308 kilos on those early maturing uh, steers last year and the beef price paid was 4 euro 37 on average, giving us a carcass value of 13 euro, uh, 100, uh, 1346 euro which was about 230 euro up on the previous uh, year. So a huge difference of beef price from 20, 2020 to 2021. So that gives us a gross margin of 449 euro per head. Then we put in our fixed costs, uh, 115 euro, labor 100 euro. We have a land rental charge put in there, giving us a total cost then of 1198 euro, giving us a net margin of 148 euro per head. So, you know, it isn't huge, um, a huge profit. I would run about three of those per hectare. So look, you're looking at just over 400 euro there for per, per hectare. Um, so I, I suppose the reason I wanted to show that was, look, it's tight margins. Then if, if we look at, at prices this year, milk replaces up probably 20%. Our, our concentrates are going to be up 80 to 90 euro uh, a ton compared to last spring when we're feeding our calves. Um, you know, there's every every aspect of that our fertilizer obviously costs are going to be hugely increased, um, and silage next winter is going to be much more expensive. So, this is um, a fine margin game. It's all about um, attention to detail. But look, if we're fighting costs such as we look to be fighting, it's going to be very difficult over the next year to eighteen months on these systems. And uh, Declan, that's the steer job. Uh, is, uh, heifer, sorry, did you mention heifers in terms of uh, is there a difference? No, I, I didn't go didn't go through the heifers there. But look, they weren't as profitable. They're back probably maybe thirty euro ahead um, on, on the steers. So I just said I'd go through the, through the best case scenario. The year again, um, our early mature and heifers were more profitable than our late mature and heifers. Uh, and then the least profitable system was the late mature and bullocks because. They were on farm longer, they ate more concentrate. And yes, we did get more carcass, but not enough carcass to cover the extra feed costs. It's, it's just worth a comment there, Jack, maybe I'll just make a comment on, on, on silage quality within those systems. Like, so if there was one real thing, Declan, it's silage quality is absolutely of the utmost importance within a dairy calf to be system. And it's going to be a hard one to tread this year because we're going to maybe try and make loads of fodder for next winter because obviously we're going to have issues maybe with fodder. But yet, if, if we don't make good fodder or, or good quality silage for these these animals, then we're going to concentrate and we're, we're blowing ourselves out of the water then because concentrates are going to be expensive next winter as well. So I, I don't know what the right answer is there, Jack, but but it's just don't don't maybe let let the silage bulk up into this big, big, you know, cut of, cut of stuff and then you're, you're going in with concentrates. We have to keep an eye on quality too. I know quantity is going to be very important in 2022, but, but yeah. quality... We, we need to keep an eye on quality within those systems as well. 
Yeah, no, but it, it is difficult, Adam, because I mean that is going to be the push now, as you say, this year, especially with costs so high. And, and I think you've a piece there in the in the journal in terms of the, the, the price of rap where, where it's going and the, and the price of diesel where it's going. Like everyone is going to be looking for that bulk to get that kind of to cut down the price uh, of that forage made. You know, I mean, it's uh, but but the quality silage for that first winter. Can you, can you compensate, Adam, in terms of like an extra kilo? Like, I mean, if, if, if you're like, I mean, is is it like the, the yeah, but like that first winter are not massive, you know? I no, mean, they're uh, not. But like r- rations probably heading like sure, sure it's heading at the moment, maybe for four hundred. You know, it's not it's not there yet, but it but it could be it could well be there next winter. And and I know we're, we're going in. What what are you going in there, Declan? Is it a kilo and a half or maybe two kilos to the bowl? So it's it's not huge, but but that's with good yeah. quality silage you're on in 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 John Halley's. Yeah, so two kilos um, per head over the, over this winter, but like it's we're talking 110, 115 day winter uh, down sure. in the cash. You know, it's yeah. short, um, 70 DMD, just over 70 DMD silage this year. We're typically using 75 DMD silage. So we were in other previous years feeding one to one and a half kilos a meal. So like this job, it has to have high quality silage uh, in the system. If, if you're feeding dry sucker cows, I would bulk up my silage all day long. But like for this to work, um, you know, as Adam says, there's going to be a four at the start of ration prices next winter. Um, we can't probably afford to put them into the system. Yeah, well, it, it makes the margin very, very small. I mean, if, if you're talking net falling out at 150 ahead, like we'll say after, you know, give or take the guts of, of two years on, on the farm, like it, it is tidy, like things, things need to be done right, like in terms of um, performance. But Declan, is, is there any place else to kind of, uh, you, like you talked about the micro replacer, right? You talked a little bit about the animal health and we've talked a little bit about kind of the winter feed side of things in terms of the cost piece. Like is, is there any other piece that's at play in terms of in terms of cost we'll say that you know that's worth kind of a focus this year now particularly when they're standing around the ring waving their fingers that's another point of cost that they should be paying big attention yeah, no, and paying we, big attention we, to those yeah cover that yeah we covered that yeah 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 <laughs> well you're not standing around you pulled back haven't you haven't you pulled back from the ring like <laughs> and they're on their phones now anyway adam they're not around <laughs> the ring anymore like, they're on their phones. um but no yeah, yeah that, you're right i mean that initial cost is important and look what we've said it and we've covered it off well i think in fairness like you know so uh, and, but, really- but that is why we keep going on about it jack is because it is you know if yeah. i pay 10 euro more at the start it's 10 euro more off the end uh, at the end, yeah. of the end of the day, um, yeah. but like feed, yeah. feed is our own, is our main cost within that system. Um, we're, we're keeping them at grass for as long as we can. I won't be feeding a kilo of meal to the calves this year at grass. Um, you know that's just a luxury I can't mm-hmm. afford this year. So that'll definitely be gone. That'll save us maybe um, what 35, 40 quid. Um, but there's very little else hey, we can shave off this system. Are you a month too late going out to grass, Declan? Like that's really good land there. Like, could you not? Could you mm. got them out earlier? It probably go. Like we are, they'll be out by day. Say from the twentieth of April, we'll have the oldest batches will be out by day in at, in at night. Um, it's probably more of a, a labour reason that we have them in for that bit longer. But yeah, no, look, we probably could pull. Like, a, a, like they're being out, out in February the, the, in, at that time in that ta- in that part of the world, uh, Declan. You know, oh, and it, it's the yeah, Ireland's um, yeah, 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 okay. Um, yeah, look, we should have probably gone out for three weeks, uh, end of January, first week of February. You know, that's when there was really good conditions there before these storms came in, and that we probably should have been out um, for those three weeks, um, which would have probably helped mm-hmm. us in terms of we would have a lot more of the, the farm graze at this stage, and we're probably in a better situation, um, than we are now, but. It's it's I suppose having the you know been brave enough to go out in 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 January with those beef cattle. It's, it's not like a dairy cow that they can let her out for three hours and bring her back in, and she's yeah. seventy percent of her feed ate. Um, these animals are still they're like they're going out at three hundred and forty kilos. Um, I don't know. I, I think that it's it's a different system leaving them out twenty four seven in 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 dodgy weather conditions, maybe. Yeah, uh, there, was, there was a question there that came in on the from a farmer, uh, Declan. What effect will the higher price of meat powder have on the cost of rearing calves? Did you cover that off there in that slide? You, um, yeah, so, of- so currently they're up about 20 percent. That's probably I, I heard that yeah. prices are increasing again, maybe in the next week or so. Um, on a, on and a you had it at 66 basis. a calf, was it like you had it at 66 per calf? Yeah, so that's based on a 42 euro um bag of 20 kilos. Yeah. 
and a 20 kilo bag. Yeah. Um, I had it worked out about 12 euro per calf. It was going to cost us more on milk replacer for this year if we fed the same same literage. Um, but that could be actually a little bit higher now if we get another price increase. Yeah, so so you're looking at you're looking at eighty euros a calf in terms of milk replace or give or take, you know. I mean that that's where you are, and that's yeah. and that's only given a bag and a half, which which isn't which isn't big. No, Declan, let's call a spade a spade. You know, I mean twenty kilos, thirty kilos of milk replace, are like it's not it's not. Mm. I know a lot of guys that are feeding milk replace and they're, they're giving two and a half bags like per calf. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think that's um, you know I think this year we will feed less than that again, and I think we'll mm. be better off for it. Um, with the, it's going to be interesting meals. to see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, um, folks, we're getting very near the end. Any any further, any kind of final comments or, or um, final thoughts? We'll say in terms of like we've had a good, we've had a good we've had a good feel right through the system in terms of we started off with the sourcing of the calves and when they arrive onto the farm, we talked a little bit about I suppose the animal health side of things when they when uh, you know in that first couple of weeks and then we we kind of finished off with the, with the weanlings and where they are now looking into the second winter and that seventy percent of the heifers eighty percent of the heifers will be gone by September. October. I mean, it's it's it's. Um, Declan, do you, is it repeatable? Okay, we we have this issue south versus west and midlands, like kind of we we'll say in terms of you not getting the same performance. But like, I think I heard you saying that it's a model that can be repeated. We'll say if performance is well and and if the type of calf is good, is good initially. Definitely, yeah. It's what 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 goes right in in John Halley's farm is every single aspect, but that's not one or two simple things it's probably a hundred tiny little things that he's doing right um every single day the right the right decision is made a decision is made maybe ahead of time as well you know um and and it's planning and it's just precision and it's attention to detail and we can all improve on that out on farms um uh, look he has a really good grazing infrastructure again it's the rolls royce uh, of grazing infrastructure but okay, maybe I mightn't be able to do that on my farm, but I can probably improve what I'm currently doing. I can increase the number of paddocks. I can um, quicken up how, how, how often I'm moving cattle onto fresh grass. It's just all little simple things. Concentrate more on, on, on really getting them into the correct, you know, 10 to 12 centimetres of, of grass on a consistent basis. You won't get it right every day of the rotation, but if you can get it right on 18 days out of your 21 day rotation, well then, that's, you know, that's, you've improved the whole job. So it's all about um, minor gains, which will all add up to major, um, a major effect. Uh, Adam, will, will supper farmers, are, do you see them taking on a batch of kind of dairy, dairy, bread, dairy bread beef cows kind of to run alongside a, a supper system? I think I think it could, Jack. Um, I think it dovetails really well into into a suckler system. You know, if if you get a good calf at a decent, you know, low price, um, it can work well. And, and you know, not that heavy on labour out from the rear and phase. Maybe in terms of grazing, they're quite easy to handle. Um, and and they can, you know, lift output on a farm in terms of you know grazing alongside or grazing a little farm let of the farm or whatever. Um, I think it will. But but I think we need to do more work on genetics uh, that's been used and, and genetics in the dairy herd. Um, we need more buy-in because I, I don't think beef farmers will stick at that in terms of if they're blowing their mm. short or losing a lot of money on them, um, uh, you know, they'll, they'll not go back. And Aidan, on the breeding side of things, in terms of linking up farmers into, into dairy farmers, into kind of that type of calf that these guys are looking for in terms of that has better beefing characteristics, et cetera, as well. What, what do you think might be the, the piece that makes them kind of really considerate, like we'll say, along with the key goals for a dairy farmer? I don't know, Jack. I honestly don't know the answer to that. Like I've thought long and hard before, you know, previously around how what we can do to work closer together. Um, like I, I suppose the key thing, I suppose, is secure knowing that someone is there to take the calf at the end of, at the end of the, the the three week or four week rearing period, whatever it is. It, you know, mm. does offer certainty, and that the farmer mm. will get rewarded for you know spending the extra two or three weeks feeding that calf. I think mm. is important. Um. Yeah, it's it's a it's a tough one, you know. It's it's a tricky one, but I mean, like a lot of farmers have the you know have that arrangement in place already. They've long standing long standing um, yeah. arrangements with, with lads who buy calves off them every year without ever going to the mart, and they seem to go well, you know. So uh, you're, that's kind of a, you know we don't see much of that, but it's it's there and it's happening and it's working. But we probably okay. need to see more of it in fairness. Yeah. 
yeah exactly that link up as you say between the, the between the purchaser and the and the local dairy farm there is a lot of it happening but more of it again as the guy said would would be hugely beneficial to everyone folks i think it's been good i think we've touched off a lot of the the important points it's it's a, it's a busy time of the year on all dairy and and dairy beef calves at dairy beef farms at this time of the year so i think it's it's a timely webinar in terms of thinking about what needs to be important for your system so that you can make a profit at the end of the day thanks to our sponsors AXA insurance and chanel for helping us make this happen remember the open day the thursday the 18th of august guys i think um in john halley's farm in south tipperary if you want to see those calves um that we saw on the VT and those yearlings was the majority of those yearlings uh, Declan will still be there at that time so and to get a full kind of breakdown in terms of how the system is uh, please come to that in on the 18th of August you'll see plenty more about it in the Farmers Journal and you can follow the progress of the Thrive uh, project as well through the pages of the Farmers Journal until uh, the next webinar stay safe and safe farming